Stanford University. We're going to have two lists, one for each side of the room. And uh, <clears throat> also, make sure you keep it circulating. So if you're not in the class, make sure to keep passing it around. Some people come in late, so uh, go ahead and pass that around. Keep it going. Um, it's on. They'll give you a thumbs up back there if it's on, yeah. So the mics are actually for the video cameras, not for micing us up in the room. So you'll still have to speak loud. Okay. Uh, so next week we have Gregory Abowd, who is a distinguished professor of, uh, in the College of Computing at Georgia Tech. And he's the force behind projects such as Classroom 2000 and the Aware Home. And most recently he's been doing work on technology for autism. It promises to be a really excellent talk. I hope to see you all there next week. He's a distinguished professor. That's what they call him. It's on his I think they, yeah, program. his students call him, dis yeah. The dear distinguished <laughs> professor, Gregory. He's also a really nice guy, too, so if you get a chance to chat with him. Uh, this week we have Jeff Johnson. Jeff is a, the principal consultant at UI Wizards and uh, will be talking today about his, he's also an alum of Stanford. And today we'll be talking about his new book, Designing with the Mind in Mind. And uh, Jeff, do you want these passed off? Well, sure. Why not? The, the it looks like there's enough the to go around. The sent me here with some brochures. There we go. If you want one, take one. They're going around. And uh, has some really excellent insights on how our, our abilities as human beings, our perceptual and social abilities affect the design of user interfaces. So please welcome our speaker. Thank you. OK. Um, just let me move this out of the way so I don't trip on it. Um, OK, so um, over the years since human-computer interaction became a, a discipline, many different uh, practitioners in the field have offered uh, user interface design guidelines. So, uh, you know, one of the earliest set of guidelines came from uh, Ben Schneiderman, uh, and it was first published in his book, Designing the User Interface, in 1987, and it's been reproduced in various forms in all subsequent editions of his book. I think he's up to the fifth edition of it now. Um, so, I don't need to read you the list of guidelines. It's, it's a fairly common set. Uh, you'll see it in many different places. In fact, if we go and look at a set of guidelines that Nielsen and Molich came out with in 1993 for, uh, mostly for evaluating websites, but also for evaluating other kinds of software systems, um, there's a lot of overlap between them. Um, uh, so the point is that developers, software developers and, s and user interface designers, are faced with the situation of having to apply these kinds of guidelines when they are designing or when they are evaluating uh, software systems. And, uh, and so that's what these are for, to, to help people who are either designing or evaluating sof software systems uh, you know, reference some, some guidelines and uh, figure out, are, is the system I'm looking at right now or is the system I'm designing, does it meet that goal? Does it meet that guideline? Well, the problem is that many of these guidelines are kind of vague. Uh, visibility of system status, what does that mean? Match between system and real world. These, these have to be interpreted. They can't just be applied as a recipe. Um, and, and interpreting them it requires some knowledge, some background knowledge. And although the field, when the field began in the early 80s, many of the people in the field of human-computer interaction had a background in cognitive psychology. 
I was one of them. You know, I, I got a PhD in cognitive psychology from here, from this university, and then went into the field. And there were lots of people like me who had that background. Nowadays, that's not so true because people who do user interface design come from a variety of disciplines, including graphic design, print design, uh, technical writing, uh, software testing, uh, many disciplines in which they did not come to the discipline with a background in cognitive and perceptual psychology. So when they are put in the situation of applying these kind of guidelines, either the Schneiderman guidelines, the Molich gui Nielsen and Molich guidelines, or these more modern ones from Stone et al., um, uh, they, people without a background in cognitive psychology, I find, uh, are at, often at a loss to figure out, wh well, what does this mean? Wh what, what does first step to goal should be clear? What does clear mean? What, what makes something clear? Okay, and so, um, so, so I, so I want to point out a couple of things about these guidelines that I'm showing you is, first of all, it should be fairly obvious when I click between them that there's actually a lot of overlap between them. And, you know, why is there so much overlap between them? Is it, it, it's not that these people who were coming out with these guidelines were seeking to show uh, how much they know about design and seeking to impose their own will on the design of future systems. Uh, they weren't just trying to be sort of uh, 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 controlling uh, uh, as to how designers would work. They, they came up with these guidelines for a reason. These guidelines are similar to each other for a reason. And the reason is that they're all based on human psychology, how it works, how people see, how people learn, how people think. And so that's the reason for the, 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 the commonality here in these, in these um, guidelines. And so it's best if when you apply guidelines, since they are based on how people perceive, think, learn, and act, that, um, that you understand the reasons. And I found also that many designers in the field, uh, by the way, there are plenty of seats, there are plenty of seats uh, scattered in the audience, and so if you, you don't have to sit on the floor if you don't want to. Um, user interface designers often balk at being told, you know, for example, um, I want the content ordered sensibly. Okay? Tell me what that means. Okay, so, so, um, so, so user interface designers often balk at being told to f apply a rule without knowing why it's a rule. Where did this rule come from? What's the basis of it? So, um, so with that understanding, I just decided to sort of put together what started as a series of lectures. I was teaching at the University of Canterbury a couple of years ago, uh, HCI, and I realized that many of my students didn't have a background in psychology. So I came up with a set of lectures on what is the psychology you need to know if you're a computer geek. And um, uh, then that eventually turned into this book. So. Um, so if you have that understanding of where these rules came from, uh, the idea is that you would then be able to better understand when two rules appear to contradict each other, which one takes precedence in this situation. Or uh, if you're, if you're going to have to make some trade-offs in your design, which rules are more important. So the, the book has a, a lar large number of it covers a large number of topics, and I'm not going to cover them all in, this, in this, uh, this talk, but I'll just give you a sort of an overview of which, which topics are covered. So these are some of them. We perceive what we expect. Our vision is optimized to see structure. We use, seek and use visual structure. Reading is unnatural. Our color vision is limited. Our peripheral vision is poor. Our attention is limited. Our memory is imperfect etc. Limits on attention shape our thoughts and action. Recognition is easy, recall is hard, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I don't need to read them all. But um, 
these are, these are essentially the chapters of the book. Um, and so let's go into some of these now. That's the substance of this talk is covering, is covering some of them. Okay, so our, perceptions, our perception is bias, biased by our experience, by the context, and by our goals. Another way of saying the same thing is that our perception is biased by the past, the present, and the future. So our experience is the past, the context is the present, and our goals help define the future. Okay, so let's look at some examples of each one of those. Um, so uh, this is a famous image. Uh, if I told you that it was a splatter painting by Jackson Pollock, how many of you would believe me? Not any. Okay, so, th uh, so let me take it away. And it, now, let me ask, how many of you saw the dog? A lot of you, okay. How many of you seen the picture before? Okay, that's why a lot of you saw the dog. But, um, so when I show this to audiences who've never seen it before, uh, most of them don't see the dog, but there's a dog there. It's, it, this is, this, what this is is a degraded photograph. You know, take a, take a photograph, Xerox it, Xerox that, Xerox that, or photocopy that, photocopy it 25 times, and then you'll get um, something degraded like this. So this is a famous image. Um, trying to remember the, the source. Um, R.C. James, that's attributed to R.C. James. Um, so, you perceive what you expect, that is to say, uh, if you've seen this before and knew that it was a dog and your brain had organized it into the dog sniffing, a Dalmatian dog sniffing the ground next to a tree, right? Does everybody see that now? Um, that you your brain actually will retain that almost forever. Uh, in so, you know, for all practical purposes, forever. Um, and so, if you ever see it again, you'll see the same thing. Uh, here's an example from the realm of computers. Uh, so, the user is on a, a multi-page dialog box, otherwise known as a wizard. They're clicking next to go, go to the next page. So they click next, goes to the next page, they click next, goes to the next page, they click next, goes to the next page, <laughs> and they click, and it goes back. It goes back to the previous page. And the, in the user tests where this kind of thing is done, essentially what would happen is the moderator would say, why did you go back? And the user would say, what do you mean? I clicked the next button, and it took me the back by mistake. There must be a bug. And the moderator will say, no, you didn't. You clicked the back button. And the user will say, what? Oh, gee, it looks like the back button is in a different place. Um, well, the thing is users don't, they don't pay attention to the details of the screen at all, really. They're, they're not paying too, too much attention to what's on the screen. They're, they're clicking things based on position and me memory position and finger memory and all, on all that sort of stuff. And so, so the past the past has not only have the first, the first three pages of this thing, they, that constitutes part of the past that has led the person up to this point and causes them to see the next and the back buttons in the opposite positions that they actually are. But all other, all other wizards that they've encountered up to this point have also contributed to that past. All right? Okay, so, so expecting the next button to be he here, where the, where the back button in fact is, is just human nature. That's the way people are going to see it, because uh, not only were the last three pages that way, but all previous uh, wizards they've seen have been that way. Okay, so here, now let's talk about the context, how the context can affect perception. Here's two identical symbols, in fact it's a copy of the same symbol. But what, it, what your eye sees it as depends on the context in which it appears. So it's either a strange H or a strange A, depending on 
what other letters surround it. So the current context affects your perception as well as the past. Um, the third one has to do with goals. Our perception <coughs> uh, focuses almost totally on our goals. And we tend not to notice things unrelated to our goal. This is to, this is to say, I'm talking about adult, adult humans. We tend not to notice things unrelated to our goal. So if I show you this and say, find the, um, uh, find, if, if, well, let, let me just ask you, um, I want you to find the scissors. Okay, were, th were there scissors in there? Okay, uh, was there a screwdriver? Okay, so some of you saw the screwdriver. Okay, that's good. Very observant. Okay, so there is a screwdriver. Now, actually, there's a game you can play. It's a, par a parlor trick game, which um, shows an, a diff an interesting difference between adults and children, <coughs> which is that everyone, most people have in their house somewhere a drawer that just contains miscellaneous stuff. Like, for example, in, in our kitchen at home, we have, you know, we have knives in one drawer and we have silverware in another drawer and, and kitchen towels in another drawer, but there is one drawer that just has a pile of all sorts of different kinds of utensils because, you know, it's just miscellaneous. And so, or maybe somewhere in your house you have a tool drawer that has, you know, like woodworking tools of many <coughs> different kinds. I don't know. But, but the game is this. So you're sitting in the living room, up in a different room from whatever, wherever that drawer is, and you tell someone go into the room, get me, open the drawer, and get me the wrench. Or if it's the kitchen drawer, you say, get me the turkey baster. And then they come back with the turkey baster. And then you say, what else did you see in the drawer? Most adults will have no idea what else was in the drawer because it wasn't their goal to see what else was in the drawer. With children, you know, young children, four, five, six years old, First of all, if you can get them to come back, uh, because they'll, they'll have found all this cool stuff that'll completely have taken their mind away from whatever it is that you asked them to do. But, you know, if they can get them to come back, they can tell you a lot of things about what, what else was in the drawer that, that um, um, adults won't be able to tell you. So, you know, in, in the case of web design, for example, if we s land someone on the homepage of the University of Canterbury and we say, um, I want you to find me, uh, I want you to, I'm going to start you on the homepage of this, of this website and I want you to print me a map of the campus that shows the computer science department. Well, what will happen is extremely predictable. What will happen is people's eyes will start scanning this page very quickly, extremely quickly. Their eyes will scan the page and they'll focus on the word department wherever it is or the word map, wherever it is on the page. And most of the other rest of the page will be ignored. Or perhaps, it, perhaps the person is a search person, so their eye will immediately go to the search box because they'll say, well, this is one way I can accomplish that goal of finding a map of the computer science department. But they probably will act actually end up going away from the page without ever noticing that they've been randomly chosen to win $100 <laughs> because that wasn't their goal. They weren't assigned the goal of, they didn't have in their heads <laughs> the goal of, of, of looking for that. All right, so that's the past, the present, and the future affe affecting perception. And, you know, where this comes up in, in U HCI or user interface design practice is, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting in the observation room of a usability test with the developers sitting next to me and the users clicking around the screen and can't find the way to get to the goal that they want. And the programmers are sitting there, you know, you usually, I sometimes have to put my hand over their mouth because they're sort of screaming, no, can't you see it? It's right there, it's in front of your face. No, they don't see it because either the past the present or their, their goals are guiding their perception in a completely different place than where this thing that there's the button they're supposed to be clicking on is positioned or um, 
or maybe their their mind is causing them to reinterpret the label of it in a different way than the than what the programmer thought it would be interpreted. Okay, so let's talk about the next um, fact uh, about uh, perception, which is our vision is optimized to see structure. Uh, back in the 30s and 40s, there were um, psychologists in Germany that were called the Gestalt psychologists, uh, and they came up with these principles of visual perception. Today, uh, they, they were, the Gestalt psychologists regarded themselves as coming up with theories that explained visual perception. Today, um, cognitive psych psychologists and cognitive scientists don't regard the Gestalt principles of visual perception as explanations. They regard them as descriptions. Today, uh, when people offer explanations, they want them to be sort of based on the brain and neurons and how those function. And so the Gestalt principles were thought of more, are thought of today mostly as uh, d descriptions of how the visual system works, but they're still quite useful. They're useful for designers uh, to, it's good to, to, for designers to understand them in order to get, get an understanding of uh, some of the ways in which they can uh, do des design things to take advantage of the fact that the human visual system operates in this particular way. So there's a whole list of Gestalt principles, and I'm not, I don't have time to go through them now, but let's just cover two that I happen to uh, like a lot. I like these two principles. Uh, they're, they're very interesting to me. One of them is closure. They're related to each other, these two principles, closure and symmetry. The closure principle is that we, st we tend to see whole closed objects, not collections of fragments. So this is two triangles and three circles. It's not, see, actually, what is here, really? What, what is here in this image? All that's really here is three Vs and three Pac-Men. Nothing else is there, right? But that's not what your eye sees. Your eye sees three triangles and three two, sorry, two triangles over, overlapping each other and three circles. Because your visual system is hardwired to see a whole objects occluding each other, that's, it's hardwired to see that. So, you know, in, in system design, so for example, when we put a, a stack of, of envelopes on somebody's desktop, computer desktop, they're going to see it as a stack of envelopes and not as some strange little rectangles with a little thing sticking out from it that, you know, is only, only a little sliver of an object. They'll see a stack of envelopes. Symmetry is even cooler as a principle. The principle of, of, of symmetry is that the brain parses whatever scene is in front of it in, the, in, the, in such a way to extract the smallest number of mostly s highly symmetric objects, let, let the smallest number of objects with the most symmetry that, they, they, that it can, automatically, okay, Inst almost instantaneously, okay. So, for example, this sim figure here is perceived as two overlapping diamonds, like that, and not as two V structures that are kind of stuck next to each other. Because, because the oh, two overlapping diamonds has more symmetry, it has not only vertical symmetry, which this also has, but it also has symmetry in each of the figures in, this, in, the, in the horizontal direction. Okay, whereas, whereas that symmetry is lacking horizontally in the, in the, in the two Vs sitting on top of each other. Jeff, is our parsing of these experience contingent as well? For example, if you had me spend the previous half hour playing with L-shaped blocks, would I see this <laughs> as a pair of L-shaped blocks? Or is the claim that somehow it's wired in? The claim is that it's wired in and I'm going to actually come to, that, come to that a little bit later, but basically, uh, see, well, well I'll, just, I'll just give a pre-view pre, uh, uh, of what I'm going to say later, which is we have 
we don't have one brain. You know, w we have this thing in our head and we call it the brain. But that's actually just a sort of a convenience. There are, three there are at least three things in there that evolved hundreds of millions of years apart and operate at different clock rates that are in there and we call them all the brain. But there are these three things in there that, 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 op that are operate differently. And one of them is going to see this as two overlapping, uh, two overlapping diamonds forever, and there's nothing you can do about it. And the one, one, the one that you can train, which is your new brain, essentially, uh, is you could probably tr train it to see these, these, these corner pieces, corner tiles, or whatever you want to call them. But remember that it's operating 100 times slower than the, than the other one. So, um, and we'll come, we'll come back to that. But if you combine symmetry with Go, uh, and you change the Go to say, uh, count how many symmetries you see. I actually saw many more. Right, just okay. Just the two L's uh, and, yes. you know, the double diamond, but many, many more. And so you, you, you start to scan very differently the image that you present. Right, right. You, you know, what can happen is basically you present this to a person and, uh, uh, you know, their reptilian brain will see, see something. And then, then the, the other brain can come in and say, okay, well, if I analyze this, I will see, uh, you know, many different, many different symmetries. And here's another set, right, Th which is, you know, a strange eight-sided thing with a square in the middle. You know, you're these are all, this thing on the left, sorry, this thing on the left is, could be any of those. But, but the brain sees first the two overlapping triangles and then it can sort of, it can kind of deconstruct it into whatever it wants. So for example, I love this cover from Thagard's book, Co Coherence and Thought in Action, which there is no cube, right? There is no cube. There are only some strange uh, shaded parts of circles. There are some strange disks. But your brain sees a cube. Is that true for natives? Sorry? People with mathematics background will obviously agree with you, but if you take right. some ladies, okay. they may have another, another idea how this fits together. Right. And so the question, the, the question is, if you show this to a Maasai in, in central Kenya who, who didn't have an education, or at least didn't have our kind of education, uh, what, what would the Maasai see? And the Gestalt psychologist would say the, that the Maasai would see the same thing. But of course, then there would be a problem of language and how to, how to get from him what he saw. Yeah. Yeah. That. Right. Okay. Anyway, um, I mean, there there have been there have been some studies where you take somebody who's lived in the forest all their life and you take them out into the plains and you ask them to interpret what they see and they're at a loss because they've never seen things that at more than a distance of about 50 feet. Right. So when they see things that that are five miles away, they don't know how to interpret it. Well, here, for instance, the mass I could say, I see six arrows in two tenths or whatever. Yeah, in right. Whatever. Okay, uh, now that was about the, 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 gestalt, the gestalt principles. Um, now, how can we apply them in, in user interface design? Well, we seek and use visual structure as one of the, one of the chapters in the book. Um, and if you since the brain is actually set up to the brain, I include the eyes in the brain. Actually, you know, neuro neuroscientists more and more include the eyes and the retina as part of the brain. You know, it's just, it's just sort of an extension of it that happened to have pushed itself out and it's on the front of our face. Um, uh, structured information is easier to perceive. So, for example, if you present somebody with information like this about a flight, uh, if you structure it, they can, their eyes can dance over it and they can extract the useful information from it much more quickly than if they actually have to read it as prose. 
And so similarly, uh, if I told you here that I wanted you to find the information about, um, uh, let's see here, um, prominence, well, in this case, you, you would have to actually read through this, excuse me, to find the information. Whereas if I created what's called in graphic design of clear visual hierarchy, then someone can move dry, directly to the information about prominence. And the, the, the interesting thing about this is they can do that faster by ignoring everything else. They can ignore whatever is on the page that has nothing to do with their goal. Their brain has the goal and it moves the eye to the word prominence. That's one of the things that the, the visual system is very good at is that it's, it, the good visual system is very good at, the, the perif peripheral vision is bad. And we'll get to that. Peripheral vision is very poor. But the one thing the periphery is good at is guiding the eye to move toward the most likely thing that's related to the per current goal, whatever that is. Ma makes the, makes the, the eye move the fovea, the high resolution part of the eye, to that spot. And so, so if, you, if I told you to look for prominence on the right, you would, your eye could move very quickly to the information about prominence and ignore everything else. And that's what people are trying to do when they're trying to navigate through a user interface or a website. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to satisfy their, their goals and they're trying to get to it as quickly as possible and they're not reading all that wonderful text that you spent so much time writing. I'm sorry to tell you. Okay, so let's talk about color vision. Let's compare the color sensitivity charts for a, vid uh, for a c color camera and the visual system, the human visual system. On the right, we have a color camera. So it has the familiar pattern of there are some cell detector cells that on, its, on its visual element that detect uh, bl blue, green, and red. And since no detector cell is perfect, these aren't vertical spikes. They're sort of, they're sort of bell curves. Uh, depending on how good those detectors are, these curves can be very steep and can exclude, can, can not overlap very much. But, okay, so, so, so these, these detectors, the, the, gr the blue detectors are sensitive in this range, the green detectors are sensitive in this range, and the blue detectors, red detectors are sensitive in this range. And the pixels that, are, that constitute a photograph are um, uh, the sum, summation of these. So, so basically, it's an RGB value. Okay. Now, the human visual system has a, has a chart that looks like this. That's pretty different from, from this. Uh, and notice the overlap here. The, the, the ones that we call, see, on our cones, we have, we have in the cones, there are, th there are three kinds of cones, and we call them red, green, and blue. But actually, that's, you know, if you learn that in school, that's really not accurate. What, what the sensitivity ranges are, sh as shown in this graph, they overlap a lot. In fact, the red and the green overlap completely. And um, the blue is much less sensitive to light levels than the, than the other two. So how can a visual system that has this kind of, these kind of color detectors in the retina, how can it produce sensation of color? How can it do that? It, well, it can't do it by our adding together red, green, and blue. That wouldn't work when you have curves that overlap this much and, and that, that differ in, in their uh, overall amplitude this much. So what it does is it works by subtraction, not addition. Okay, so you have essentially red minus green blue minus yellow. There, there are three channels that come out of your color receptors. Red minus green, blue minus yellow, and a, a sort of a complicated, complicated function of all three that essentially leads, gives you brightness. All right? So there's three channels. 
as I said, red minus green, blue minus yellow, and brightness. Okay, now you might say, why are you talking about the cones with brightness? Because don't we have rods? Rod, don't rods, isn't that where we get our brightness? Well, sort of, but usually not. Because, because basically the rods, you, 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 you probably learned in school that we have rods and cones, and the rods are brightness, and the col cones are color. But the rods were actually, they're designed to detect light at low levels very low levels. Now think about, th think about it this way. When did lighting, lighted environments come about? How long ago? About 1900, right? Up until around 1900, humanity and every other organism lived in an environment that was dark most of the time except in, you know, during the day. But, you know, at night, uh, th things were dark all the time. And, and when you're inside, even if it was uh, daylight outside, it was dark, right? And, you know, Lincoln read his, read did, and did his homework using candlelight, okay? Um, so, as it turns out that the, the, the rods in, in most of the environments in which we live, the lighted environments that we spend most of our time inside or out today, the rods are maxed out. The, ro the rods are maxed out and not providing much useful information. Basically, the rods in your retina right now are going, ah, all the time, right? They're all doing that. And so they're not providing any useful information. What, what's happening is that the cones are producing three channels. One of them is brightness, one of them is colors, uh, blue, yellow, and one of them is red minus green. All right? Okay. So, uh, and because of this subtraction, the, the other thing is that they're not too sensitive, your, your visual system is not sensitive to absolute light levels. So if I were to, to tell them to d drop the lighting in this room by 5%, you wouldn't notice it, especially if I did it over a, an extended period of time you wouldn't notice it, or 10% or 50%. It'd have to be something like 60 or 70% before you'd start to notice. That's what happens in a movie theater when they darken it. After, after they've darkened it about 50%, then people start to go, oh, the movie's about to start. So, so one of the things that, 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 that uh, affects that that causes is an inability to see uh, uh, absolute shades. So for example, uh, what if I told you, do you see this checkerboard pattern there? Now, one of the problems that we have, that I always have when I give this presentation, is that the projectors always show the image much darker than it shows on my screen. On my screen, it's quite, quite a bit brighter than it is uh, on, the, on the projector. But in any case, it doesn't matter. Do you see the one marked A, square marked A? here. See the one mark B? What if I told you they're the same shade? They're the same shade. The square. The square. Both, actually, it doesn't matter. They're the same shade. So, okay, I'm going to prove it to you one way. I'm going to take a piece of each one out with Photoshop. I'm going to grab it and move it out put it over on the right. Okay? Now you still don't believe me. <laughs> you don't believe me. So we're going to do this. We're going to take that image and we're going to cover that, then we'll cover that, then we'll cover that, we'll cover that, we'll cover that, we'll cover that, we'll cover that. <laughs> Let me do that again. <laughs> so as we cover up parts of the context, um, see this was this this image was developed by a friend of mine, actually a school classmate of mine named Edward Adelson, and it's he's a brain scientist and he wanted to come up with a way of showing that the visual system doesn't see absolute levels, and I think it's a really good, um, really good il illustration of it. 
there, there are some people who said, you're still changing the colors of those as you, as you cover the thing up. But See absolute levels or, or that we don't perceive the absolute levels? That's the same like thing. This isn't that, that, that is the, the same. You just said the same thing twice. OK. Because <laughs> it seems like this is another example of, of what you were showing before about, you know what, we were picking out the, the simplest symmetries. Like this is, uh, like we're, we're trying to pick out the, the description or, or explanation of this scene that is simplest, is, uh, uh, can be represented with like the least information. Right. And like for us, like the explanation that this is a, a 3D cylinder with a shadow um, and that that checker is in, in shade and therefore actually lighter uh -huh. is simpler because we're like living in a 3D environment. Well, that, I guess that's one way of saying it. I mean, what one could, one could say, one could, could, could ask the question, why did Edward Adelson have to put a 3D cylinder in the, on the checkerboard and, and that, if it's casting a shadow in order, for, in order to convey this image? Why couldn't he have just left it a checkerboard, right? Well, if he'd left it a checkerboard, then there wouldn't be a shadow, and therefore he'd have to have B be the, this color. And, and B, this is not the same shade as that. So the, the, the shadow is actually, it's an excuse to make this that same color. Uh, and your brain, um, you know, since, since you tend to see this as a 3D thing and you interpret the shadow, yeah, I guess, I guess maybe there is something to, to your explanation. Um, so, uh, in other words, this wouldn't work that too well without this. So I'm wondering, like, the 3D, how important is it, the 3D element? Um, well, um, uh, there, are, there are other illustrations of the same principle that don't use the 3D element, if I'll just... If, if I just, yeah, this is a famous one that you've probably seen elsewhere, right? Those two dots are the same color, but one of them is inside a black background and one of them is inside a gray background. But they, and so therefore they don't look the same color, but they in fact are the same color. This, 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 is, a, this is the example you find in all the textbooks. But, but Edel, Edelson came up with that one, so I, I put it in the talk. It's, it's, it's pretty good. Okay, so um, let's move on here. Um, so color vision is limited. So people have trouble discriminating pale colors. So when two colors are pale, people have trouble telling them apart. Now the interesting thing is that, again, the projector is, is darkening everything that, that I display. So, you know, on my screen, looks like that. Uh, so it's harder to tell those two colors apart on my screen. But when colors are pale, basically people have trouble telling them apart. Um, when color patches are small, they're harder to tell apart than when they're larger. Okay? And when they're far apart, they're harder to tell apart than when they're close. Especially if eye movement is involved, because if eye movement is involved, then memory comes into play. Sorry? If you did not put a border around them, they would also be harder to discriminate. Yes, right, right. So the interesting thing about these is that for those of you sitting close here, probably eye movement is involved between the two, whereas the, the people in the back of the room, they might not have to move their eyes between those two, two separated patches because they have a, their, the visual angle is smaller. Um, so, you know, when we talk about design, uh, you know, for example, of websites, um, we don't want to have colors be too close to each other, uh, otherwise people may not be able to see the difference between them. So, for example, on this page, some of these uh, links are visited and some aren't. Which ones are visited? Which, which links have been visited? These, you're saying. Well, as a matter of fact, on this particular website, it's these. So, they, so, so not only did they get, did, did they get the two 
colors to be too close to each other so that some people aren't going to be able to see them. And also, again, it will depend on the display, right? It will depend on characteristics of the display and even whether you're standing in front of it or off to the side. If I'm looking at the side of mine, they all look black. As soon as I move to the middle, then I can start to see the difference between, between the two. Um, but not only did they use colors that were too close to each other, but they used the wrong ones, right? They, it's supposed to be the less saturated one that is um, uh, m more, um, it's, it's less saturated means it's visited. But they, they flipped it. Uh, and, f and so, for example, at, at ITN.net, which is a travel site, they use color to determine, tell you what stage of the s you know, getting your airline tickets you're on. Can, you can see that you're on stage one. Is that right? You can see that? It's yellow. But that's pretty pale yellow. And on my screen of my computer, it's so pale that it's hard to see. And if I, again, if I stand off to the side, I can't see it at all. And if I had some kind of color vision deficiency, I might not be able to see it. So we moved to stage two. Stage two. Um, another uh, uh, characteristic about of the visual system is that some people have color blindness. Color blindness doesn't mean you can't see color. It just means that there are some pairs of colors that you have trouble distinguishing. About 8% of males have some kind of color vision de deficiency, and about half a percent of females. Um, just out of curiosity, is there people here who know that they have some kind of color vision deficiency? Just raise your hand if you. I just want to see if we're where we are in the 10% or the 8%. Okay. Um, so a friend of mine who is who has red green red green color blindness um, tells me that these these two lines he can't tell the difference between. He can't see the difference between those two lines. So if you had a graph, a business graph, in which this was the only way in which information was being conveyed, he would not be able to see it. You would have lost that person. Similarly, he can't tell the difference between these two lines. To, to him, they look the same. Now, the interesting thing is that he is diagnosed, or he's been said to be red-green colorblind. These, the one line I would call red, and the other one I would call black. But he's called red-green color blind, yet he can't see the difference between these two. And similarly, he can't see the difference between these two. But his, his, he's called red-green color blind. So there are certain pairs of colors that he can't see the difference between. Dogs, for example. You know, when I was growing up and going to school, I was told that only primates have color vision and all other animals don't. That's complete fabrication. It's, it's completely wrong. There are some shrimp that have six dimensions of color vision. We have three. <laughs> okay. There are so, uh, cats. Cats are an interesting example. They have three kinds of color receptors on their retina. For reasons we don't really understand, cats behave as if they're totally colorblind. That you, can't, you can't really train a cat to, be, to respond to color. There, there are some people who've claimed to be able to get cats to respond to the differences between uh, yellow and red. But uh, other than that, I mean, mo most, most people say that you can't train a cat to, be co to, to respond to color, even though they do have three kinds of color receptors on their retina, just like we do. Um, and that could, because, because, that could be because cats are in the wild, before they were domesticated by people, they, they are primarily a nocturnal animal. Animals that, animals that exist and live and do most of their activity at night tend to be colorblind. Um, dogs are kind of an interesting example because they have only two color receptors. And so they are, they are actually pretty much equivalent to a person who's red, green, colorblind. Try, you have great difficulty. You, you basically won't be able to get the dog to d distinguish between red and green. So especially if you have dogs reading your website, make sure you don't use red and green as a distinguishing piece con conveyor of information. Basically, what you want to do if you use color, see, I don't want you to go out of here and say, Jeff Johnson says, don't use color in your designs, because of course, that w the world would be very bland. What you should do is you should use color redundantly with other cues. So, so if I were fixing 
itn.net, I would, I would not only color, use a more saturated yellow for the current step, but I would also bold the box in which it was and bold the words and the number. You know, as a designer, I would do that. So that color is not the only thing that's conveying the information. Does that, that make sense? Now, ITN, you know, without any input from me, I had no contact with them. They didn't hire me as a consultant or anything. I just did this in Photoshop. But they ac actually came out with, more recently, with a new version of their process, uh, which also follows the same principle, using color redundantly with other cues. You cannot, f even if you were totally colorblind, you would have no trouble determining what step you were on here. Okay, let's talk about the peripheral vision. Peripheral vision is poor. There's an error message on this page. Do you see it? See the error message? It's right here. This is an actual line login page from a client's web app. And what would happen is, what would happen is when we did observe people using it, they would log in here, they would click this. If they had an incorrect number here, if they put in some incorrect information here, what would happen as far as the user was concerned was the page would redisplay with the fields blank. And the person would go, huh, I thought I, I, thought I put the number in there. I, put, I thought I put my ID in there and password, and I, and I, I think I hit the right button. Did I hit, click cancel? What, what happened? Did I click the wrong button? So then they fit, put in the same wrong information again, and the page redisplays again, and they can't understand it. So after about two or three loops, they go, what? And they're really frustrated. They sit back in their chair, their eye scans the screen, and they go, oh, there's an error message there. How long has that been there? How come I didn't notice that before? And of course, the programmer's sitting behind the, the glass in the observation room going, you stupid idiot, why don't you see it? It's right there in front of your face. Here's why they don't see it. This is the visual system. This is the retina. This is the center. This is 70 degrees out, which is about the edge of your visual field. Here's the center. Let's look at the distribution of, of uh, light sensitive cells. I want to pay mostly attention to the cones. The rods are distributed mostly in the center, but actually they're, they're not in the, they die out, they, they're, there are no rods in the absolute center. But uh, they, they do kind of fall off as they go out. But we can, as I said, we can mostly ignore them because they're mostly maxed out most of the time in Western industrialized society. So let's, let's pay mostly attention to the, to the cones. Hold your arm out at arm's length and look at your thumbnail. That's the size of your, that, that is the size of your fovea, the center of your visual field, high resolution. Everything else is low resolution. Low resolution. Everything else is low resolution, okay? So let's talk about how high and how low. Um, the resolution on, on your fovea at arm's length is about 300 dots per inch. So if you printed 300 dots per inch anything, like images, text, whatever, on your thumbnail, with, if you have good vision, or like I have with glasses, without glasses, I'm not anywhere close to that. But if I, with my glasses, have 300 dots per inch at arm's length, that's what normal vision is for most people, okay? Um, so you can distinguish the dots in a 300 dot per inch pattern on your thumbnail at, at arm's length, all right? That's the resolution of the fovea. What do you think the resolution is at the edge of your visual field? Somebody have, a, somebody have an estimate? One tenth. What if I told you it's measured in, in pixels per foot? <laughs> yeah, <can> you. <laughs> The answer is three pixels per foot. At the edge of your visual field is a pixel is about the size of a melon at arm's length. OK? 
Okay? Now, you don't believe this, right? Because you're looking around the room, and the room looks high resolution everywhere you look, right? But your eye is moving constantly. It's moving about three times a second. It takes a tenth of a second for it to ex execute an eye movement. While your eye is moving, vision is shut off. But you're not seeing all this blink, 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 blink of the world going off and on and off and on because your brain is filling all of that in. Your brain is also filling in the res high resolution around that, that, you, that, uh, the rest that your eye is not noticing at the moment. There, you had a question. What about things that are in motion? Is there a difference in uh, the way you perceive things when they move? <laughs> is it strictly uh, what I'm going to get to later is it, it, what I was going to get to later what I'll get to now to answer your question is the visual the per periphery is doesn't seem to be good for much since its resolution is so so low but it actually is very good at detecting motion and we'll come to that it, 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 it's its job is to move your uh, it's its job is to stimulate your brain to move your eye to where whatever's moving so that you won't be eaten by with that thing that's moving was there a question in the back uh, I was just doing an experiment. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. people, people put their hands here and they sort of move it to sort of see. See, the thing is, you know, it was a revelation for me to learn this because, you know, I studied cognitive psychology here, right? And, and I didn't know that there was, I knew there was a disparity, disparity in, in, in resolution, but I didn't know it was that great. It's, so what that basically says is if I'm at a party and somebody walks up, up next to me, and does not speak so that I don't know who that person is, and, my, and if I have, do not move my eye and I'm staring straight ahead, that person could easily be a cabbage, and I couldn't tell, right? You know, so I don't want to, but I don't want to tell my wife that she could be easily be a cabbage. <laughs> but as soon as she speaks, my brain will fill in an image of my wife over on the right. I'll see my wife, even if I don't move my eye, okay? Yes? Does it work differently for people who can't hear well? Since, you know, some sort of auditory input is probably helping you yes. localize where, um, where interesting things are happening. So if you are auditorily impaired, does your visual system uh, compensate for that sort of thing by increasing resolution or something? No. Okay. No, you just, you're, you have problems. Uh, if the dogs run up to you and you're deaf, mm -hmm. you're, you're going to, you, the, the dog is going to get you, basically. Okay, so, so, so here's, here's why. Here's, here's why that, that, that disparity in resolution exists. At the, at the center of the fovea, there are about 160,000 cones per square millimeter. They're packed in there. And at the edges of the visual field, actually not very far off the fovea, there's about 10,000 per square millimeter. So that's almost a factor of 20 less. Okay? So that's, that's, that's factor number one in determining this disparity in resolution. There are three factors. That's factor number one. Disparity in density of uh, color, of, of, of light detection cells. Number two. The cells that come out of the center of the visual field that, that are in the fovea, that are in that little area that corresponds to your thumbnail, send fibers to the optic nerve that goes back to your brain, that goes to your visual cortex, one to one. And the cells that are out here, three or four of them will send one fiber to the, the visual cor cortex. So basically the way to say it if you're a computer scientist is that information from here goes to the visual cortex uncompressed and out here it's compressed with data loss. Okay? Does that make sense? That's factor number two. Factor number three is that you've got a, on the back of your brain you have something called a visual cortex where the optic nerve basically arrives, it, it gets the signal, and the brain starts to process it. Actually that's not really true, the, the eye is already processing it, the image, but Anyway, it, get, it undergoes a lot of processing when it gets, it starts to undergo a lot more processing when it gets to the visual cortex at the back of your brain. Half of the area of the visual cortex is devoted to the fovea, and the other half is devoted to the rest of the visual field. Okay? So those three factors 
disparity in number of detectors or density of dis detectors in the center versus the periphery, disparity in how much, uh, how much, whether there's data compression going to the, to the brain, and disparity in how much of its neuron surface is devoted to uh, processing information from different areas of the visual field, those all contribute to this disparity, this huge disparity in the way our eyes work compared to, let's say, how a camera works, where the camera's visual field is, is, is constant across the whole, whole area. So one way of, of showing our visual, that disparity is this, this kind of a graph, which sort of shows you know, the, the center, 300 dots per inch, and the periphery, the pixels are much larger. Or you could also create this graph, which I like. Um, it's a sort of a conventional reading chart, but if you keep your eye focused and do not move your eye, which is almost impossible, but if you don't move your eye uh, from that dot in the middle, then that's, this sort of shows how your um, visual, w w this equates resolution at different places in your visual field. And, and it, in fact, it is taller than it is wide. That is, the dispar disparity uh, essentially is taller than it is wide. I mean, one of the things that we ha as people do is we, we can, you know, up and down is more important to us because when we were not people, when we were rodents, we actually had to look up a lot and see things that were coming down from above, right? So yeah. I noticed that people never look up in general. Mm -hmm. So I used to live on the 10th floor of an apartment, and nobody ever noticed me looking at them down in the street below. Uh -huh. So is, is that some sort of learned uh, ignorance, or is it just? Well, I mean, uh, uh, I guess what I've read, I don't know how this particularly relates to that question, but what I've read is that people, if, if you're, you're walking down the street and a, and a jetliner flies between you and the sun, and the shadow goes over you, you will flinch. There, your reptilian brain will cause you to flinch, and there's nothing you can do about it. Because that might be a hawk coming to get you. So, so basically, let's, let's, let's look at this particular display, which is, this is an interesting one, because, um, you know, in that one I showed you earlier, the air, it was fairly blatant. The, air was, the error message was in the upper left, it was in black, it was in a small font. It was way far away from the, the, from the login button. Um, here, uh, with this login at airborne.com, we see the same problem. We see the same problem with people saying, uh, I didn't see the error message. Now, they, they might not fail to see it as many times around the loop as with the other example I showed, but it still happens. Why does it happen here? Does somebody have any thought? Color? What do you mean? Because the, because the, the red login ID not found looks very similar to the text up on top. Yeah. Okay, so that can have something to do with it. Uh, yeah. Okay, anybody else? Location. They're focused on, yeah. They're focused on foo. They're not focused on login ID. Yeah, okay. Or, or they're focused on the login button, let's say. Or, you know, they're focused. Basically, people in the Western world, anyway, move from upper left to lower right when they're working through a, a, a form or a dialog box. And so their eyes are going to be somewhere over here. That's where the retina is going to be. And so let me show you. If the eye does not move from, let's say, let's say the eye was focused on the login button. You, you move the mouse to the pointer to the login button, you click. So for a moment, at least, your eye is there. If the eye did not move, this is what the eye would see, right? And, and so, so there was stuff re uh, red stuff up there before, and there is still red stuff up there. There hasn't been any change as far as the eye is concerned. So, so in terms of our design principles, Basically, there are some common methods of, be, of getting, making sure an error message is seen. One of them is put it where users are looking, if you can predict that. Uh, put it near the error. That's one of the things that people say. 
at, on the assumption that people will be looking there, that's not always true. They won't always be looking at the error. You might have to actually draw their attention to it by maybe scrolling the error to the middle of the screen or something. But uh, this is one principle that's often given. Put it where users are looking, put it near the error, use red for errors, and use error symbols to uh, make, make it bigger. Because the bigger it is also, the, the more the periphery will be able to see it. Now, sometimes you can't do some of these things. Why? Why can't you do some of these things? Well, for example, I'll give you an example. You're Stanford University. All of your, your color, school colors are red. Everything on your website is red. So you can't show red and use red for error messages because everything is red, right? So you need to use orange or something for, for error messages, some, something else. So, but I just want to show you this example of an error message that is, uh, you know, basically what happens is, you know, you fill out the online registration form at AOL.com. I, I clipped it off, but, you know, so way down here at the bottom of the form, there's, some, there's a submit button. You fill out the form, you fit, sub, hit submit. What happens is there's an error. You didn't have a password that was good enough. So it scrolls back to that, shows, puts that in the middle of the page, puts an error message right next to the thing, gives you an error symbol, and, and gives you the you know, password strength, okay? So you're not going to miss that, that, that error message. So that's, a good ex that's a, an example of a good, well-placed error message. Another... Got about five minutes. Okay. So okay? Yeah. All right. So, so another method that people use... Uh, other methods, if, if you can't use these methods here, there are some heavy artillery that you can use, but it has to be used sparingly. So one is that you can pop up messages in error dialog boxes in front of the user's face, but sometimes people, if, especially in web applications, sometimes people will turn off pop-ups in their browsers. So unless you're in a controlled environment in which you know that people are not doing that, uh, it's probably dangerous to use uh, pop-ups as in error, error dialogues, but if you know that you, you know that people are, you're either de developing desktop software or you know that you're in an environment in which people are not turning off pop-ups, so you can get, you can get away with that. That's good. Audio, beep. You can beep. That causes people's eyes to start scanning and they think, okay, it beeped. Why? And their eyes start moving and they find the error message. And then flashing and wiggling briefly, not continuously. Um, why do you want to flash? Because, again, the periphery is good at detecting motion. Your eye is going to move there if something flashes because that might be a leopard, right? Two million years ago on this African savanna, if something moved in your periphery, your eyes had to move there or you were dead, or maybe you starved to death because maybe that was your lunch and you missed it, right? So, you're, so the periphery is actually very good at detecting motion. So, for example, you can show the error message like this. So all I did with that error message was move it up, one pixel up, one down, one left and one right, and stopped. That's important to stop. And, and let, let me show you an example here. I'm not the only one who, do, who does this. For example, if you log in at, at MobileMe, Apple's online site, and you give a, you a, a bogus password, and you say sign in. Oops. Uh, so, oh. <laughs> okay. So just, sorry, sorry, just a second here. Uh, what is it doing? Okay. So. Now, yeah, okay, so here I am. So I say Fred Flintstone, and I try to log in. I give a password, and it goes. So it does that, basically, which is going to yank your eye over there. All right, so I've got to finish up here. So let me just do that. Um, so so one, one way to do that is to wiggle. But of course, you don't want to wiggle constantly, because if you do, people will ignore you, because they'll think you're an ad. Uh, you can blink. Again, that, you, you don't want to do that for a long period of time because people will think you're an ad. Okay, so um, 
Let me just figure out how many slides I have to go, and then I can. Does anyone have any questions for Jeff? Yeah. Before we. Oh yeah, there's one a couple of questions here. Okay. So, so what I was going to do, I was going to talk a little about short and long-term memory, but this is all in the book. Um, <laughs> and I was going to talk about recognition and, and recall. But I think what I'll do is I'll leave that for now and uh, refer you to the book and ask for questions. Do we get the discount at Stanford Bookstore? <laughs> is it online available? <laughs> Um, I think it's at Amazon.com. I passed out flyers that you can get a discount from the publisher, but I'll give you a secret. I think it's more off at Amazon.com than it is at, at the publisher. So your point about the um, visual <coughs> field being larger vertically than horizontally, what implications does that have for portrait versus landscape layouts? <coughs> Particularly, you see a lot of websites these days. Have, it used to be 10 years or five years ago, all websites. You're scrolling vertically, and now you're seeing a lot of horizontal scrolling. Does that have implications? Um, I think, well, I, actually, I don't know if I, I, I guess I would, uh, I would dispute the premise. I, I, I think that originally, you know, web designers, web gurus, design gurus like Jacob Nielsen were saying, don't do either scroll, holy, horizontal scrolling or vertical scrolling. Let people put out all the information on the page. If, if you have stuff down below or off to the right, people won't see it. I think now the, the, the belief is uh, people are very used to scrolling vertically. They're not so used to scrolling horizontally yet. And so it's dangerous to put stuff off to, th off to the right. Um, but I don't think that really has anything to do with this, this disparity between horizontal and vertical perception, visual perception. Any other questions? Um, I had a question about sort of the default coloring for links uh, in light of what you had mentioned about your friend being colorblind in the blue and purple. Uh -huh. Do you have any particular opinion on why those were considered as the default de facto colors to determine what is a link and what isn't? So w why did the web come up with this? Well, why did web designers come up with this the standard now of blue for a, a, a link and other colors for for a visited link. Um, I don't know where that came from originally, um, uh, but I do believe in conventions. And so I, I think that as a web designer, it's better to follow the convention unless you have a very, very good reason not to, f not to follow it. Now, I, th I believe the convention is mainly what is the color of an unvisited link. There's not so much of a convention about what is the color of a visited link. Uh, but um, if you make your, like for example, one of, the, one of the trends among web designers is, oh, we don't like those underlines on the links. So they don't put the underlines there. Uh, I, when all the websites I design, I've t started, because of that trend, I've started taking the underlining off, but it's there when you mouse over the, the link. Because otherwise, you're flouting convention too much. And people are just not going to be able to know what's a link and what's not a link. Are there any design trends, other design trends you see today that, that you don't like? Design trends that I see that I don't like. Um, well, I s th there are a lot of design trends that I see today that I don't like. Um, it's, so part of the problem is this. I think a lot of history has been lost. You know, what, for example, um, we were talking at lunch before this talk about, you know, the history of the Xerox Star and the Apple Macintosh and all of that stuff. And the people who designed those systems were very, they were almost obsessive compulsive about making sure every detail was correct. And so, for example, if you click on a word on the left half of the word, uh, then, then it had one effect. If you clicked on the right half of the word and dragged, it had a different effect, you know, and all of that's been lost, basically. And, and so, so one of the things that I find as I'm trying to use systems is that I get the wrong thing selected. I'm trying to select certain characters in a paragraph. I can't get them selected, but, you know, in star it was easy, but I can't do it in, the, in this. Uh, uh, or, um, um, uh, you know, there, there, I mean, Don Norman actually gives the example of the telephone. You know, the old telephones had, had a little button that you pressed to sort of disconnect. 
but that button was protected by little knobs. So if you drop the phone on the floor, the button couldn't be pressed by mistake. But new phones don't have that. So, so when you drop it, you know, on the phone, you know, it can actually hang up on you. Um, so, so basically, there's reasons for some of the, th the way things are, have been designed. And, and I think you know, one of the things that's happening is that some of that's being forgotten. Okay. That's all we have time for. You can ask Jeff questions afterwards. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.